is right after the book of Acts. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 2. I'd like to see if you have a phone hand. I hope you read the Bible. But seriously, folks, turn those cell phones off unless you use them for the Word. Because this is God's time. Half of our problem in the world today is we give God no time. We take time that belongs to God. Okay, shh. Everyone be still. Everybody get situated. Hey, we're... Yeah, we're taking care of it. Matt's got a metal, metal plate in his head, I think. I'm just... <laughs> Some more things, just... Yeah. The garage door goes open, right? Okay. So today I'm going to be reading from the uh, Romans. Hey, bring me down a little bit here. I feel like I'm talking in a can. Okay. You know, when I was a kid, speaking of the can, because that was what we called the boys' room. Smoking in the boys' room. And uh, when I was a kid in high school, I never got caught smoking in school because I was smoking in school. And in our school, in order to get caught, you had to literally be caught with it. I mean, you could, or see smoke coming out of your mouth. So what I would do every day, I'd walk by all the teachers, the male teachers, and I'd see their shoes and I'd see their pants. Because you're hiding down here and you're, all you can see is the shoes and the pants. So if all of a sudden you see those shoes, psst, can you stand up? Well, I'm Mr. Cross. How are you, sir? I never got caught. It became a joke. Towards the end, they were saying, I'm going to catch you this year, Sherry. Sure. No, oh, you won't catch me. They never did catch me. Got to be smarter than the enemy. I've seen him get caught, though, before. That Mr. Cross, well, he picked his biggest, one of the biggest kids in my class. He had him up against the mirror. Catholic school, so you can do stuff like that. So I sure wasn't going to get caught. I was about a buck me five. All right, so Romans, we went over Romans the last two weeks, Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one is, is a solid foundation that explains about Paul is writing to this church in Rome that he does not know. He's never been there before. He has heard of their faith. He's encouraged by their faith. And he is sending them a, a, just a masterpiece in reality written by Paul's uh, associate signed by Paul's hand, but truly inspired by the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest of all the books of the Bible. And so it has foundational principles that this is why I feel Father wants us to go through this. So Romans, we found, we finished talking about that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it's the power of God in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And towards the end of the, the book, we're talking about how because of people's wickedness and their evil hearts, God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do things that they should not do. Women doing things with women. Men doing things with men. Haters, boastful, pride, haters of parents. Wicked people. And so this is where we come to Romans chapter 2. I'm going to read it uh, from the New Living First translation. I'm actually coming out of a King James uh, Bible, but I want you to really understand what he's saying. So I'll drop a few of these in the vows. So you understand it is to you and the needs. And it's important that we that we understand what he's saying here. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. You may think you can condemn such people. So he's talking about these terrible things that people are doing. And as he's saying, haters of God boast for all these things. So then he says, you may think you can condemn people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself, for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in His justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing such things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the very same things? And there are people out there, this is what we call people that are moralists. I'm a moral person. And because I'm a moral person, they say, I can judge people whose standards of living doesn't match up to my morals. You have to be careful doing that. Because oftentimes, if you try to throw your standards, and sometimes a moralist, their standards are false anyway. But even as a child of God, when you try to blanket your standards on other people forcefully, they don't get it. The carnal mind cannot receive the things of God because they're spiritual. So when you're in a relationship with somebody who's not spiritual and you're trying to trying to blanket them with spiritual things. They don't get it. And it can cause dissension. 
You have to ask God for wisdom. If you chose to stay in a relationship with this unbeliever, as the Bible says, then, then it's your job to, by God's grace and mercy and the leading of the Holy Spirit, to live such a life that, that can bless them, that honors them, that doesn't tear them down, but that they can see the goodness in your life and they want to emulate that rather than you saying, if you don't live this life, you are going to hell. Or I can't have nothing to do with you. cannot do that. That's what a moralist does. A moralist is someone who just says they judge people because they don't think they live the lives that they should. And I see that with people. There's nothing that hurts. I'll never forget one woman came down here and um, she was here at Empty Tomb one time and she was saying, well, ah, these are not my people. That's what she said, out of her mouth. Well, I said, well, they're God's people. These are not my people. I mean, all people. You know, who's better than anyone else? Nobody. But you get that in this moralist attitude, gets that attitude that you're better than somebody else. And if you've been called from darkness to light, praise the Lord, but remember it's been by God's grace and not because of your goodness. Once you start thinking it was because of something you did, then all of a sudden that arrogance can start to grow like a hulk inside of your body. And you don't want that to happen. Nothing stinks in the nostrils of God like spiritual pride. Nothing. Pride's one thing. Spiritual pride, God hates it. He says, verse 4, Do you, Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from sin? That the goodness of God is, is to bring us to Christ. You know, when somebody can, if, when God came into my life and I saw by His goodness He would forgive me and He would, he would wash me clean from my sins and He'd give me a new life, I absolutely love God and I still love God. Why? Because He's so good that He can love a rest like me. He can save a rest like me. And so we never forget where we come from. Never. If God took his hands off you guys, you'd be just as big a mess as you ever were. And that's a fact. So the Bible says when somebody uh, starts going backwards, they go back and they get four times worse, seven times worse. Stay with the Lord. Stay humble. Stay, stay face down. Walk softly with God. Because, But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin... You are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to they, what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing what is right in the, in the gospel, seeking after God's glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his righteous indignation or his wrath upon those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth. Instead, they live their lives of wickedness. So there are people who go to church every single Sunday. They know all the words to Ferris, Lord Jesus. They know all the words to Holy, 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 and Amazing Grace. But their heart is full of wickedness. They, they're critical about other people. They don't see their own sin. They see everybody else's. Some of you guys, I hope you're honest today and say, you know what? I think that's me. I think that describes my heart sometimes. And when it does, you have to ask God to forgive you. Again, we walk humbly before the Lord. You have to. You've got to stay low and count every day a blessing that God loves you, that God is giving you another chance. This morning I was dreaming before I actually got up and I was, I was in this awesome dream doing a lot of awesome ministry. Supernatural things were going on. And when I came to, ready to get up, I realized, wow. Oh. Because when something like that happens, I don't see it as me doing it. I just see it as God using this vessel to do it, and it's so awesome. I've seen, oh, goodness, I've had dreams of being here at the tomb. I remember one time there the, the, was a dream, and the Lord was moving so powerfully here at the tomb. And I walked out into this dream to look out the little square window on the door that you all come in, and I saw people on the stairs, I mean like five across, all the way down the stairs and as far down the road as I could see hungry for a touch from Jesus. I had a dream one time that my wife and I we were in the house that I'm in 
and the kids were had to go to school and I got up and you know sometimes you look outside and see if it had snowed like we do in the winter time. <coughs> I got outside and I, I looked outside and there were people blind, halt, sick, lame on the on the on the on my front yard. And I remember in the dream, I said, honey, I'm late. I, I got to get out of here. You're going to have to create a diversion so I can get out there. Because these people wanted me to pray for them. I'm nobody. But when you allow Jesus to use you, my goodness. But Jesus does not use arrogance. God will not use prideful people. I mean, can you people say, well, this guy was preaching us and we told him not to. Well, if he's preaching us, he's for us. Paul said whether well, preaching in pretense or for reality, at least Christ is being preached. But in reality... The vessel that God chooses to use is that vessel that knows there's no possible way they could do it on their own. Absolutely no possible way. I've seen people healed by the hand of God. I've never healed anybody. I've seen people healed. I've seen many lives changed. I've never changed anybody's life. But I witnessed it. This is what it is to stay humble before the Lord and not to think yourself as anything else. Because once you start thinking yourself as somebody, you'll start believing it yourself. Because we as human beings are stupid. And we like praise. We need to learn to deflect praise. Be like the moon. The moon takes the rays of the sun and it reflects light. I want to take the rays of the Son of God and reflect the light of Jesus wherever we go. And that's what we have to do. Hey, Matt, you see this big monkey here in the second row? Uh, he said, no, not dog. Uh, he's a big monkey, too. Between the two of these guys, I've got about, about 550. <laughs> this is my bodyguard. I've known this guy since, I was, since he was in fourth grade. He was about six foot tall in those days. Stand up a minute, Greg. Not trying to embarrass him. <laughs> yeah, fourth grade, yeah. Hey, that's my friend Greg Klein. Welcome, brother. I remember... One time Matt and Greg got into a little a little altercation or something like that when they were kids. And I said, well, what did you do with that big dude? He said, I had to hit him with the school desk. <laughs> he had to hit him with the desk. Well, that was slow down. Anyway, welcome, brother. Yeah. So, we got to stay humble. We got to stay before the Lord because God blesses and heals those and works through those who stay humble before Him. Let's go up here to verse 17. Or excuse me. Yeah. No, let's finish this. Excuse me. Let's start 9. Verse 9. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But there will be glory, honor, and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. And being good means obeying the word of God, obeying God, living up. So it's not you being good can earn something that's already been given you. If I give Matt a gift and then I say that'll be $25, it's no longer a gift. I sold him something. God did not do that. He said, here's Jesus and I don't want anything back from you. Because if you want something back, it's no longer a gift. I bought it. But the awesome thing about this gift is He bought it for me with His own blood. Jesus Christ paid for your alcoholism on the cross. He paid for your sexual perversion on the cross. He paid for your depression. He prayed for all sin on the cross. And then He came and said, listen, I love you. Here. Here's eternal life. Now you could say, well, <laughs> well I can see why He would give you that eternal life. Or uh, you made me extra special. You made me intelligent. You made... That's where we get in trouble. That gift will cost you. It will cost you. But the real gift of God is free. When the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed, even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law does not make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in His sight. So you can say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And honestly, guys, and I can't judge you. You can't judge me. But can you honestly say between you and God that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. All is, is a small word, but it's big. <laughs> That's a big word. All. It takes nothing away from anybody else. It's just everything you've got's first got to be God. God knows if it's true or not. 
That's the thing. There's the difference. When you love the Lord that way, man, God just showers His blessings on you. And He uses you. And you know something? I want to encourage somebody here. You know, I'm, and not just one, my brother Tim, he's here. Uh, this brother just, man, he's ready to preach. He's like me when I first got saved. Man, I was preaching to the trees. I preached and he listened to me. But you know, there's a time of gestation. There's a time of gestation when, when there's a conception and then there's the, the, the part of the nine months before the baby's birth. There's a time when Father will just let you wait on Him quietly. When I was really seeking the Lord in my early five or six years, I was on my face before the Lord. I would be weeping before not understanding why he wants anything to do with me. That went on for years. Even though I knew Father had something he wanted me to do, I just couldn't get through the fact that he even wanted to use somebody like me. But there's a time when God will set you aside. Even the Apostle Paul, he had that amazing experience on the road to Damascus. But then it says in Galatians, 14 years later, I mean, he was out in the out being taught by the Holy Ghost. Sometimes it takes time. Do not rush the Lord. Don't rush a Chateau Briand. Let it, let it cook during this time. Let God's process be perfect. Yes, sir. Incubator. Good one, brother. And that's really, really good. So, just because you listen, remember, to listen and to hear are two different things. To... to to hear is to, to know choir is singing, but to listen is to know the words of the song. So you can say, well, I heard you, but, but you didn't listen to me. This is what God is going to say to some of you. I heard you, Lord, I heard you, but you didn't listen. If you just hear and you don't listen, nothing's going to change. You've got to listen. And he's saying to you, come to me, obey me, be humble. Just let me take over. Let me take over. Yesterday in Colossians we did a fantastic study and the awesome thing we learned in the book of Colossians chapter 2 is we are saved by grace through faith and that not of works, it's a gift of God, so we're saved by faith. The awesome thing is after that is then we live by the same grace that saved us. We live by the same grace that saved us. God gives us grace to walk in, in holiness. God gives us grace to walk in humility. He gives us grace to walk in love. He gives us grace to walk in power. It's all grace. Because once it's not grace, it's you. And once it's you, it's not God. There's no you in G-O-D. So we've got to keep ourselves out of this thing. It's all by grace. It's by grace that I can stand up here and speak to you. Grace only. Absolute grace. Yeah, brother. See, when you walk with Jesus, God can make the devil your plumber. Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Hey, you know what the Bible says? When a man's ways please me, I will make even his enemies at peace with him. Hey, listen, Satan's got nothing on Jesus, brother. That's a fact. He's got nothing on you. That's right. Yeah. You got a problem with me? Talk to my boss. And take care of your crew. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right. Even the Gentiles, verse 14, who do not have, even the Gentiles who do not have God's word, written law. A Gentile is someone who's not a Jew. Okay? They don't have the word of God. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. But he's saying here, even the Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they do instinctively what it says, even without having heard it. So God has given us his conscience. I've told people before, you know what's right and wrong. Even if nobody said, thou shalt not commit adultery, you know you shouldn't do it. And if, when, if nobody ever told you, thou shalt not steal, you know you shouldn't steal. You know these things because God has put it in us. So even those who did not have the Ten Commandments given to them, they know instinctively what's right and wrong. God has put that in our lives. And so you are without excuse. 
They demonstrate God's love is written in their hearts for their own conscience and their thoughts either accuse them or tell them they're doing right. And this is the message I proclaim that the day is coming when God through Jesus Christ will judge every man's secret life. His secret life. So the things that, you know, somebody might look like they got it all going on, but what's going on behind the scenes? God knows. I don't like, you know, you hear some of these people's lives after they're gone and all these, all these terrible things come out. Guys, don't live that life. If you give God your life, He cleans out the closet with the skeletons in it. Because when you give God your life, you begin to live resurrection life and there ain't no bones in the tomb no more. Step out, remove the grave clothes and live. And no more looking back. No more looking back. You call yourselves Jews, you who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law, you who boast about your special relationship with Him. You know what He wants, and yet what is right because you have been taught His law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for the people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children your ways, for you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then... If you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal. Do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Now remember, Jesus said you commit adultery in your heart, even if you look at someone lustfully. So if you're thinking those things, you're committing adultery in your heart. So, don't pass judgment. If, if, what do you say? Don't take the don't try to take the splinter out of your brother's eye if you got a log in your own. You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scripture says the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. And that's what people do in the world today. Some people blaspheme the name of God because the way Christians live their lives. They live these unholy lives. And people say, well, man, if that's a Christian, I don't want any part of it. We all have a part to do. We have all been called to live, to walk, to, to, to honor Jesus with the way we live our lives. And when we don't, Jesus gets a black eye. And he should not ever get a black eye from us. Now, if they want to accuse you for something you did that you didn't do, they want to lie on you, that's totally different. They'll do that. Jesus said they'll do it. But when you give them ammunition by the, the sinful life you're living, that's on you. So the first part of Romans was about the moralists. Now we're starting to talk about the religionists. These are the people who have religion. The moralists say, well, it's not about the law, but I'm a moral person, and you don't live up to my standards, and because you don't live up to my standards, you're going to go to hell, and I'm going to go to heaven. The religionist says, because I am a Jew, because I've been given the law, I am above you. But Paul's going to tell us later in Romans, what shall we say there? Shall we sin so that grace may abound? Absolutely not, by any means. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than the uncircumcised Gentiles. Now, circumcision goes way back to the time of Abraham. And God made a covenant with Abraham to be his people that all the male children when they were born on the eighth day would be given their name and circumcised. It was a sign that they were God's children. He's not talking about circumcising their flesh. He's talking about a circumcision in your heart. That God has made a change in your heart. And you belong to him because he's, he's changed your heart. Not because he's changed your physical appearance. And so this is what he's trying to talk to them about right here. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will, contain, will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law but don't obey it. Remember I told you a couple weeks ago about the story of the Good Samaritan? The, the man was, this Jewish man was beat up, left for dead on the highway. Here, Jewish priest. He sees him. Blade, bloody, he's alive, but he went on the other side of the road, wanted nothing to do with him. How did he show love? To his own brother, his own brother Jew. Then here come another person from the temple, sees the guy, a Jew, obviously on the ground, one of his own brothers, 
walked on the other side of the road, didn't do anything for him. But then here come this Samaritan man. Samaritans and Jews, they didn't like each other. They hated each other. Samaritans, the Jews thought, were like half-breeds. So they didn't have anything to do with it. They didn't speak to each other. But the Samaritan man, he sees this Jewish person, didn't care if he was a Jew or a Gentile, because his heart was circumcised to do right. He stopped and he ministered to him. He cleaned his wounds. He, he put him on his own animal, took him to the nearest inn, and he gave money to the owner and said, if you spend any more on him for his well-being, I'll pay you when I come back around. That is the difference between someone who has the law just in their body and one who has got the, the who's been circumcised in their heart. Verse 28. For you are not a Jew because you were born of a Jewish family or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No. A true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. So if your heart is right with God, you are a descendant of Abraham. You are a true group, a, a, a true Jew. Because the Bible says Abraham believed God by faith and it was credited to him as righteousness. So by faith, Abraham was credited as righteousness because he believed the promise of God that a Savior would come. And so this is what saves us. Are you a true Jew in your heart? And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. When I gave my life to Jesus, things that I used to do and had no problem doing them suddenly were a problem to me. I was convicted by it. I knew what was wrong. Not, not that I didn't know it was wrong before, because I really knew it was wrong, but everybody else did it, so what the heck. But once your heart has been touched by God and the Spirit of God begins to move in your life, you can't compromise that anymore. He won't let you. He'll change you. A person with a changed heart seeks praise from God and not from people. That's the end of the, the, the chapter. A person with a changed heart seeks not praise from people. We seek praise from God. We want to praise God. We want to be honoring to Jesus. I long deeply for the day that I see Jesus face to face to hear Him say, Well done, Spirit. He's not saying well done because that's what it says in the Bible. Everybody who crosses over the gate isn't going to say, hear him say, well done. Some are just going to be saved by faith, but they did very little with the life God gave them. But some, some are going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. I want to hear that. They say there's going to be jewels and crowns and all these things. I don't care about all that. I just want to see him face to face. I would love to hear him say, Steve, you did good. You did what I asked you to do. You honored me with your life. You said no to the desires of your flesh. It was easy to go this way, but I wanted you to go this way, and you went the way I wanted you to go. Guys, it's making a choice. When God circumcises your heart, it's time to start living the life you know you're supposed to live. Live a life that honors God. He does it every time if you'll trust Him. So if there's anyone in this room who today would consider yourself a moralist who would say, you know what, I've been kind of critical of other people. You know, look at that guy over there. He's always out there flying the sign and doing that. You know, because some guys want to judge people. You don't know what their situation is. And here you are trying to work another angle. Really? How about if we just come clean with Jesus and do your best? And when you see somebody be led by the Spirit of God, you know, when I see folks that are flying the sign, I'll be honest with you, I know so many of them. <laughs> so, yeah, some of them I know what they're going to do with that money, so I'm not coming for them. But, if the Lord leads me to give him money, and I've done it before, I'll give it to him, whatever he tells me to give him. One time we went by, down here on St. Mary's, I knew this guy, and he was obviously loaded. And my first thought was, no, I ain't giving him no money. And the Holy Spirit said, give him a figure. And I thought, mm, okay. And I'd already passed him. I'd go all the way around and give him the money. And when I came back around, this guy was he dancing. He had his hands up. Praise the Lord. Who knows what he needed? I don't know, but God knows. I just want to be that vessel that God will use to be a blessing to someone else. If I take time to judge them, I can't take time to love them. Remember that. 
If you take the time to judge them, you're not going to take any time to love them. God did not call us to judge them. He called us to love them. Jesus does the judging. And He will judge. You do not know that He's judged. Now, sometimes we've got to judge folks in the church when people are doing wrong. But as individual people, don't be judging people. I pray in Jesus' name that every time you go to judge somebody, God shows you a picture of yourself. I pray every time you go to judge somebody, God shows you something you're into that you know you're not supposed to be doing. And you'll, He'll stop your mouth. He'll stop your, your judgment. Now, Where? last week, I know people gave their lives to Jesus. Where? What's that, brother? Uh, I just lost my mother-in-law Monday. Sorry, brother. And, and I just want to say a prayer for Okay, what's your name? We'll pray for her family. What you got? Guess what? Brianna? Good, Brianna. Okay. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray, we pray for this woman's family. I pray that she knew you, Lord. And I pray that the family comes to know you before they leave this earth also. I pray people would realize the shortness of life on this earth. And I pray, Lord Jesus, out of the Word of God that people would make changes today to their lives. That we would do a spiritual and a mental evaluation. And if our lives are not pleasing to you, Lord, by your grace, by our humility, Lord Jesus, we can't be pleasing to you. Only by faith can we be pleasing to you. So, Father, move on hearts in this room in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's people in this room you've not yet given your life to Jesus or may have, but you've been living.